Okay, so let's uh, go back to our main text here. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, so the whole world worships the Antichrist. And these people are listed as whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb. So their names are not written in the book of life up in heaven. So up in heaven, God has a book of life. Now, if you're saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, your name is written in the book of life. Praise the Lord. And this is from the Lamb. Now, here's the thing, however, is that these people who all worship the Antichrist and Satan himself, all these people... Their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You'll notice that, right? But then the verse says this, which seems to support Calvinism over here, okay? So notice that how it sounds like Calvinism is that the next part of the verse, the last part of the verse, look at it, it reads this way. Slain from the foundation of the world. So notice right here, that ever since the foundation of the world, so here comes our best friends, the Calvins. So it's like from the foundation of the world. Ho, 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 exactly. So because it's ever since from the foundation of the world, that ever since before we were all born, these guys were already predestinated for damnation. Now, uh, if Calvinists want to be technical and say that's not what we said, whatever, okay? Uh, I know you mean predestinated to be his elect, but to be quite honest, if you pre predestinate someone to be the elect, you're predestinated someone to be damned, okay? Yeah. So let's not be technical about this. Yeah. So let's just be simplistic. Okay, anyways, so that's what it seems to show. But one, they're not reading the verse as it says. Mm -hmm. Two, they're not comparing scripture with scripture. And three, they're not using common sense. And that is the evidence of Calvinists, as I've shown you so many times. They lack so much common sense. They cloud it with theology and in intellect that they lose their common sense of reading the Bible. Okay, so it does not say from the foundation of the world. It says, your pastor read this. Verse 8, slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, so it's not the book of life ever since from the foundation of the world. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Lamb that was slain. That's what you got to realize. So as the Lamb that was slain from what? The foundation of the world. That's what they're not reading over there. I mean, read the verse as it says. They're not reading the verse as it says, right? They're not. They're not reading the verse as it says. Now let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, shall we? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Now let's compare Scripture with Scripture. Church, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, let me, before I read this text, let's look at the common sense that they missed out over here. Even if we were to suppose that these people's names were not written in the book of life ever since the foundation of the world, use some common sense. Duh, of course their names were not written ever since the foundation of the world. You know why? They weren't even born yet, so they didn't even get saved yet, so God didn't even put their name down on the book of life yet. So were all of us. None of us, uh, even the God's elect, woo, how about that? Even God's elect, special Calvinist elect, their names weren't written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. That's common sense, see? So whether you want to put it to the Lamb's book of life or you want to apply it to the Lamb's slain, it don't matter, man. Calvinism is bunk. Either interpretation goes. So look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Right? The lamb, just like Revelation 13. Colon, explaining it, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. See that? How about that? All right, let's go back to our main text. 
So Calvin can chew on his beard a little longer. So let's look at Revelation chapter 13 and verse 9. Okay, so we know that this is invalid. This is totally false. Despite of how many PhDs, theological terminologies, and they brag about debating. I want to debate you. Debate, debate, debate. It don't matter, man. It, you're still wrong. <laughs> if any man have an ear, any of you got ears? Yeah. Let him hear. Open up your ears and hear. Your pastor always said that, right? At Revelation 2 and 3. It's one of my lines. Any of you got ears? Then hear. So notice that God repeated that in Revelation 13. But you'll notice that he hardly mentioned that. Revelation 2 and 3, you remember Revelation 2 and 3? Revelation 2 and 3, he kept saying, if any man have an ear, let him hear. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He was saying that to the seven churches. But he has been very absent in saying that until chapter 13. You might say, why is that? Because it shows right here that this chapter 13 is something God wants you to pay attention to. It shows that over here. So there's a balance over here. The balance is this, is that you'll notice that your pastor mentioned from the beginning of Revelation 13, 1 through 7, that God never specified. God did not really specify on the identity of the Antichrist, like who the exact person is, or what the exact name of blasphemy is, or all the other things. He was giving clues, but he didn't really specify why? Because he doesn't want to pay too much attention to the devil. However, at the same time, you'll notice that verse 9, he does want you to be alert. Just because that God does not want to give so much credit or attention to the devil does not mean that you're playing ignorant and playing stupid about it. See that? So there's that balance that Christians got to maintain. A lot of Christians don't have that balance. Uh, when they st uh, Remember, one example is the Genesis Gap. And another example is the Genesis 6, where Satan's uh, fallen angels were mingling with people. The exact sin with the seed of the serpent, with, uh, with Eve and the serpent, and what Ham did with Noah, not really spe uh, specified or really clear. Why doesn't the Bible give uh, these things like really detail? Why doesn't God say, you know, before Adam and Eve were created, Lucifer had a kingdom with dinosaurs running all over it. Why doesn't the Bible say something, something plain like that? then we wouldn't fuss about it, right? The reason why is God does not want to give so much credit to Satan's kingdom as part of his biblical history. He doesn't want to give so much credit to that. But at the same time, God did mention these verses as clues, indications for you to study and search. Why? Because he does not want us to be plain ignorant about Satan. His devices are. And when you look at Satan's devices from the Genesis gap, Genesis 6 with the fallen angels mingling, and what, serpent, what the serpent did with Eve and what Ham did with Noah, which is very strange, we can see Satan what? He was trying to revive his kingdom over and over again. And when you are aware of this device, it becomes more enlightening about today's modern kingdom of Satan, how it's run. Okay, so that's what we should be doing when... Uh, studying about the identity of the Antichrist and conspiracy theories, the top of the pyramid ladder of the elites. Look, what, what you got to be doing with all that is what? Just simply, all you have to do is just know the basic stuff about it and then let it go. Don't get infatuated with it. That's the thing. Just know enough where you're aware, where you're not plainly ignorant, and then after that, you don't have to know every specific detail. Okay, let's go back to our main text. Verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Okay, so the, when we're following the context here, verse 8 and 9, uh, verse 8 is the Antichrist. Verse 7 is where he's persecuting God's children, right? So what we can follow from this interpretation is obviously the Antichrist is taking captives, slaves of the tribulation saints. But guess what? He's going to be captive himself. So the Antichrist and his minions that have persecuted God's saints, they're going to be slaves and captives themselves. You might say, really? Yeah, if you, the, the greatest evidence is that when you read uh, the major prophets throughout the Bible, it talks about these pagan countries who persecuted the nation of Israel, that God said they're going to be slaves and servants 
later on in God's future kingdom. How about that? They're going to be submitted to him. Not only that, if you're in hell, if you're burning in hell, you're already a slave down there. Because the Bible says chains of darkness. See? So you're a captive in that sense. So whether it applies to the kingdom on earth or a kingdom that is in hell, they're going to be captive either way. Uh, we're going to look at James 5. So keep your hand here, James 5. I'll, I'll show you one example of tribulation saints being slaves. Dr. Uckman has this awesome video that uh, I'm very happy our church watched it last time. But it is his apocalypse movie. So Dr. Rutman has an apocalypse revelation movie. And in this one, he played a scene uh, and he put sad classical music in the background. And it kind of sounded, it kind of gave the atmosphere of a Jewish Holocaust, act actually. And in this, there are concentration camps set up. He shows, he paints a picture of concentration camps set up where these demonic creatures in red are whipping the backs of the saints who are working at the fields of the Antichrist as slaves. So we're going to look at the book of James, chapter 5. Now, notice that this book is about end times. A lot of people try to apply this to the church, but hey, that, you got to watch out for that. you got to be dispensational. This is mostly... This is mostly a tribulation epistle, you got to understand. So you got to watch out for tribulation highlights. Look at verse 3. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for when? The last days. Why? Because look what these rich people did. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back. By fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. So notice that the just, see, God's saints are pictured as the poor, while the evil people are pictured as the rich. If you only apply this to the Christian church, like some people who are against dispensational salvations will teach, then this does not make sense. Obviously, we have rich Christians today too. So are we going to call rich uh, Christians who make good money that, oh, uh, you're evil, you're full of the devil? Mm. Obviously not. We can't do that. So the just are likened to the poor, whereas the rich are likened to the evil people. And notice that they're making these poor people work in their fields while enslaving them. You might say, why is it rich versus poor? Simple. We already read Revelation 13 a bit. Remember, you cannot buy or sell. So you can't make money unless you have the mark of the beast. Why do you think the Antichrist will set up a mark of the beast system to save the economy? See that? Because it uh, wipes out, it eliminates the population-wise. And then when he eliminates the population-wise, you get these people who will make up the market, who will help the market as slaves. And slavery is a big money business thing. Uh, that's why during the days of the Civil War, you got to understand, a lot of southern states, it was hard for them to abolish slavery. Why? Because slaves made money for the, for the nations. It made big money. So the Antichrist is going to do that, but he's going to use it in a justified sense. These people are hate people already. They're terrorists. They're against our solidarity. So we should put these people to work. I mean, th this makes a lot of sense because look at prisoners today. Prisoners today, they're doing community work, so to speak. So it makes logical sense that the, it's not a far stretch to say that the government, they're just going to take more wider measures of com community service, so to speak. See that? Okay. Let's look at some other texts over here where the Word of God reads. Keep, if you'll notice over here, verse 7, it says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto when? The coming of the Lord. So that's proven that this is tribulation. These just people are waiting for God to come down and rescue them. But it says, be patient, right? 
Go back to Revelation 13. It says be patient, right? Go back to Revelation 13. Notice how Scripture interprets Scripture. Read the last part of verse 10. The last part of verse 10. Here is the what? Patience and the faith of the saints. See that? So they have to have patience while they're having faith in the Lord. Why do they have to be patient? Because they're being captives. Why do they have to have faith? Because they have to believe in his promise that he's going to return. Now let's keep reading verse 10. He that leadeth in captivity shall go into captivity. We get that part. He that killeth with the sword. See, the Antichrist and his minions, they're killing the saints with the sword. But notice what here must be killed with the sword. Yeah, they're going to be killed. That's why Revelation 19, what does the Bible say? Jesus Christ comes down and then a sword comes out of his mouth and what? <laughs> Kills all the enemies, the Antichrist minion. So that's the interpretation of the passage.